competition you either makes you better or it threatens you. You are listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhees. You know, people want money without working for it, and this really isn't anything new. We see it all over the place today, but this attitude has been around for a long time. It's as old as mankind. Yeah, if we go back to the story of Adam and Eve where uh, Cain took uh, um, and killed Abel in the, in the, uh, in the field, uh, Cain was just jealous that he had to share 50% of the world with uh, Abel. He wanted the inheritance all for himself. So right from the very beginning, there's the, been this attitude that what is yours is mine and what is mine is mine. And we have to overcome that. And we have to realize that there's really just kind of two attitudes in the world. Either I see you as competition and I need to eliminate you, or I see you as competition that makes me better in providing the needs that other people will want that will purchase it from me. Hmm. And so really, when you have a lot of people providing goods and services, uh, ultimately it provides more selection and more options for everyone. It really um, does. It, sometimes in the short term, it seems that, that, that there's a competition in between uh, people that are trying to provide the same sort of products and things like that. But over the long term, as those differences adjust out, it does create more opportunity, uh, goods and services for people at lower prices. It does. And, and in our field, when we're competing with other people and trying to produce the best designed of life insurance for our clients, um, it makes all of the products better because if there was no competition, then there would be no incentive to make a better product. Mm. And uh, that's true with uh, Ford and GM, Toyota. That's true with uh, different department stores. They're all competing so that they can uh, win the, um, the desire of people to want their product. Yeah. And that, that's good. Yeah, it's been said that the customer is keen. It is. Now, sometimes that does eliminate some people, but that shouldn't be the motive of me trying to make a better product. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily want to eliminate somebody. I just want to make a product that more people desire. Mm -hmm. So going back to the, the attitude that people want money without working for it, what are some, some manifestations of this in our, in our world today? Even, even some simple manifestations that people wouldn't necessarily say are terribly wrong. Well, you know, some people um, are jealous, mm -hmm. and, and, and jealousy is resenting or being bitter or hostile that someone has something that you would like. Okay. And then the other one is envy. And envy is it's just, a little more uh, subtle, isn't it? it? It is a little bit more subtle. Um, but envy by itself can, can promote us to work harder to get what other people have because we see what they have and we, oh, I would like that. But we, with envy... So a, mo a motivation, if you will? Yeah, it doesn't necessarily come with the bitterness or hostility or hate that jealousy comes with. And so, um, you know... The key here is is that when we combine those two together, we get something called covetousness. Mm. And Shakespeare um, said it best when he coined the phrase green envy. Uh, uh, you know, Shakespeare said in Othello, the green-eyed evil monster, mm. you know. So now we've got jealousy and envy working together and... Um, that makes it appear that what is yours is mine. It sounds and like a I, recipe for disaster. I can, just, I can just mow you over. It doesn't matter what I do to you because I want what you have. And that's really what we're seeing today with all these looters going into stores and just walking out with all the merchandise. Mm. They don't give a hoot about what they're doing to those people, that they're destroying other people's life. It's what we see the elitists do when they raise our taxes and... and um, and cripple us by uh, putting a burden on us that they wouldn't even want to bear themselves. Yeah, interesting. So what about more simple matters, such as even people um, saying, well, you know, I'm just going to put 
the groceries or the gasoline on the company card today. Uh, that's the very that's that that's the same thing, you know. If you've been entrusted with a a business card with your corporation and you decide to fill your own gas tank up with it or you know you think oh well this is just a little thing i can take it from no one's going to miss it at my store mm-hmm. i can just take this ream of paper home or you know my boss is rolling in money i why not put uh you know you know help myself to these supplies because he will never miss it. Yeah. So, yeah. so whether it's supplies, whether it's, you know, even taking care of personal affairs on company time, um, or even, uh, you know, people, a lot of people who would consider themselves law abiding citizens, uh, it surprises me, uh, how often when we get together and are talking, they'll, how, how, how many of them would exaggerate an insurance claim to try and get a little bit more money out of the insurance company? Cause supposedly they're getting back some of the premiums that they've, They've been paying these for some reason over the time, and they don't they don't uh, take in mind that that increases the cost of premiums for everyone. It does. It it increases the cost of uh, of 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 the price of ev- of goods and services to everybody when that takes place because that's taking something that doesn't belong to you with the idea that oh it's owed to me anyway. Mm-hmm. So so why mm-hmm. is this attitude detrimental to survival? Well, eventually, like as Margaret Thatcher said, um, there's only so long you can spend other people's money before it runs out. Mm. And if we continue to always believe that we're going to gain off someone else's efforts and not put any work into that ourselves, then, um, you know, pretty soon if if someone's not rewarded enough for what they're doing, they're just going to stop doing it. And if, uh, if, if enough people use the 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 uh, the you know the boss's credit card to fill up their personal gas tank, there's not going to be enough funds to go around to fill up the commercial vehicles that the boss needs to be filled up. Sure, um, it's the same thing with government. And it, it might seem at the time that this is such a small little bit that it's not going to make a difference in the big picture, um, but but it's the attitude that's detrimental to you. You know, it's like uh, it's like. Which drop of water makes the glass overfill with water? You know, the first drop or the last drop. Yeah. It's it's just so much happens that pretty soon, it's it's uh, becomes got, a problem. You've got a disaster going oh, on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, this is this is a problem that we see in finances where people think that they can just put their money over here. And it'll just grow without them ever even concerned about it or working about it or understanding why they put that money in that investment. They just think that money grows, like my grandma used to say, on trees. But Mm. money doesn't grow unless we put an effort into it. And uh, And I guess that's one of the reasons they call some investing just speculation because people are just like gambling. They're not really thinking about it. They just hope to win something that really belongs to somebody else's work and effort. Mm. Interesting. So when we're, when we're thinking about how this applies to finances, um, th- there's some interesting um, I- ideas that come to mind. Maybe, maybe before we go to the finances, we should talk a little bit about the attitude that, that this goes, um, goes with. Pink Floyd kind of addressed it with the <laughs> song, Another Brick in the Wall. Um, people think, well, I'm I'm just a little cog in the wheel here. I'll take a little bit extra. Nobody's going to notice. I'm just another. Everybody else is doing it, so why shouldn't I? Yeah, that that's a pretty famous song where you know everyone is molded exactly the same, and that's what the elites are trying to do is make us all these little bricks that they can stack up to build their own edifices. Um, you know, there there's a song that was written years ago by um, Mavlin Reynolds who talking about the little ticky-tacky boxes that everyone lives in as she was driving between San Francisco and uh, Menlo Park, California, and all these little boxy houses on the hills going down that. I remember driving that when I was in college. They're all the same. Every mm. one of them look just the same. And, and you can see that in just about every neighborhood development across the country. You go in and, and every third house is the same. Sure. You know, uh-huh. It all looks the same. They're just painted a little bit different. And uh, 
at the time she wrote the cloths, they were green and yellow and pink. And uh, but now th- in our neck of the woods, they're brown and tan and gray. And <laughs> yeah, here, you know, here in the desert climate, but, Las Vegas. But you know, the, they're all the same, and everyone is is trying to go out there, and uh, they all end up the same because that's the way the pre-planned society, the elitist, want us to be. They get put in boxes. They d- we they put us in boxes, and we need to be careful and not be put in a box because we need to be um, unique. Mm-hmm. Being unique is what makes us be able to to generate something that somebody else wants. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to be the same, mm-hmm. and yet that's what the elites are trying to make us become like. And in doing that, they're trying to control us. Instead of driving, uh, instead of they're trying to kill our incentive or our motive to be different. Mm-hmm. Um, schools are the same way. You know, everybody gets blocked, and that's the Pink Floyd song. You know, we don't need no education. Uh, well, education is great, but we don't need no schooling mm-hmm. because schooling just. Uh, everyone fits in this little block, and if you don't, you get a, you get a label, and and that label sticks with you throughout the rest of your life, because you know you were a little bit different than everybody else. <laughs> but the scripture tells us we're not to compare ourselves to other. We're to, we're to work, and do our work heartily for the Lord. And when that happens, He gives us His creativity to design things and progress, really progress, not the progressiveness that we talk about today but advance society, advance our civility, and produce things that normally would be scarce and create an abundance that everybody can enjoy. Mm-hmm. You know, we were, I was listening to someone the other day, I think you, you might have been listening to the same same person, The um, he was talking about the Wright brothers, and a lot of people say that how out-of-the-box thinkers that they were for that time. And he said, this particular speaker was saying, you know, I don't think that they even had a box to begin with. They were supposed to be bicycle repair men from Ohio. Right. Yeah. Aviation technicians, some of the most advanced at their time. It is fascinating. Uh, how, how do you get out of the box into something like that unless you didn't have a box to begin with? It's a, it's a good point. It is. And, and they weren't, uh, they weren't uh, honed and polished and compressed in, in uniform bricks like, uh, like what the elites want us to become today. Mm-hmm. You know, if you step out of your little niche and do something unique, uh, sometimes you get slapped on the hand from regulations and things that uh, uh, the politicians and the elites have put into force. Mm-hmm. So um, that's interesting. And the, the element, the, really the, the key element here is that human creativity, human action is always a component that cannot be calculated on a spreadsheet ahead of time. Well, I think a good example of that right now is the trucker's convoy that we're seeing in in Canada. You can only push people so far before their creativity says, enough. We're not little objects that you can move around on a chessboard. We are individuals. We have rights that were given to us by our creator. And we're going to stand up for those rights regardless of what happens to us and um, whether we're destroyed in the process we believe in this, mm-hmm. and um, God rewards that behavior as long as it's done peacefully and in a, in a, in a proper manner. You, you know, it's interesting because that's a, that is what the early settlers to America did. They faced persecution in Europe and, and England, and they, they came over. A lot of that was religious persecution, so they came here to the United States to start over again to America. And um, as they grew, then a lot of people think that uh, there was a certain point where everyone just wanted to rebel against England. And although there were probably certain uh, types of those spirits present in the uh, in the assemblies and in the uh, in the neighborhoods, <clears throat> the 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 main thrust was not to uh, to go to war with England because it was very unlikely that America would have won that war. They were the the biggest military power in the world at that time. And so the, um, so, so the, the main thrust was for peace to try and reconcile the, the differences that Americans had with Great Britain. And when that f- did not work out and it couldn't work out, then the, the revolutionary war was kind of the last resort. Yeah. So war was not, uh, they worked for years, um, to try to come to an agreement with the crown 
and yet um, they still were um, uh, forced to fight that war because they were not being represented. They were having something shoved down their throat that that didn't sit with their belief system. Mm -hmm. um, it was tyranny. It was an elitism. It was a monarchy that was saying, this is the way it's going to be because I said so, and you don't have any say. And they understood that that's not the way that God created individuals. And so when we have elites today telling us that we all need to conform to our little box or our little brick in the wall or that we just need to settle down in our little ticky-tacky house that's just like everybody else's, we don't have to accept that because in America we have a constitution that says that we are in, uh, that uh, recognizes the rights that God gave us to be, be independent, to be free, to cr be creative, and um, and it's when we work in that effort that society is advanced, mm -hmm. and when when that is curtailed or regulated so powerfully, then what's going to happen is progression is going to go backwards rather than than advanced society. And I think that we see that in many areas today because who would have thought that people would have been rushing into department stores or Walgreens or CVS and walking out with merchandise and not being held accountable for it? It's fascinating, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, fascinating. It, it's really sad. So we've talked about you know, the attitudes that could lead to some of this behavior today. We've talked about um, some of the counter attitudes to that, like the Wright brothers and the, the human action, that they, the creativity that they brought to the picture, uh, how, um, how the American founders uh, thought differently about the world. How do we apply the, some of these lessons to the way that we manage our money today? Well, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's really fascinating how when free people think independently will mutually join together because they realize their strength in numbers mm -hmm. and their strength in competitive ideas. So that goes back to what we talked about at the very first. We can see as competition as someone that we need to eliminate so that we can be keen or it, competition is something that makes me better. And, and the Proverbs that Solomon wrote says, um, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. And so when we see our competition not as someone that we need to eliminate, but someone that is going to hone us and make us better, then it behooves us to mutually join together in certain efforts to, to, make, the, to make something better happen. And mm -hmm. that's what the mutual life insurance in, industry did to begin with. There were people that were suffering because people died and there was no income for their family. It started in the Presbyterian Church in this country way back in the 1700s where they said, look, um, you know, our, our pastors and our leaders, uh, you know, when they pass, there's nothing left for their family. So they united together and, and they formed the first life insurance company that ever happened in America. And from there, uh, you know, we've expanded. There's lots of life insurance companies, but there's very few mutual companies that exist solely for the benefit of the policyholders. Interesting. And so when the insurance company runs the business well because of this mutual competition contained within it, then what happens is those profits then are, are given back to the policyholders instead of going to some stockholders that are just gambling with their money, saying, oh, well, let me put some money over here and see what these people will work up for me <laughs> to do, and what, what will they give me? Interesting. Okay. So um, now as we use that, uh, that lays the foundation for everything that we do here at Life Benefits for our clients, and that's you know helping people become their own banker because in that type of a situation, the insurance company will loan us money simply because we have a policy with them because that policy becomes collateral and now we can use that money just like a banker would. And, um, and that gives us an advantage over what other people have to do is when they pay their interest, they're paying the interest on using someone else's money to an entity that will never benefit them. 
Yeah, and, and you know it's interesting. A lot of people in their the way that they invest on cater to the government. Uh, rules on taxation as well, because because they're trying to save taxes, and yet they're giving up something very important called access to their money uh, over a great portion of their life, while they quote save this money for the future. And although they're catering to that, um, and you know putting that money back into the economy in the form of investments, sometimes in stocks, bonds, or combinations of those things, uh, although that is happening um, without the access to their money. Um, the element of human creativity is often lost and it becomes a little bit more like a brick in the wall. So for everybody to have same sort of plan, same sort of everything, uh, without access to capital, it's harder to exercise human creativity. I mean, you think you think about the Wright brothers, as we used them as an example earlier, if they would not have had access to the uh, to the money the, that they were able to save from their bicycle shop, it would have been hard for them to develop the, uh, the first airplane. Well, you know, let, this goes right back to the very beginning again, uh, John, where God said to Cain, where is your brother? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? And God said, your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And because you spilt his blood on the ground, then the ground will never produce for you again. Even though you work it and till it and manage it, you're going to wander all over the place and the ground's never going to do anything for you again. And Cain realized at that point that he had done something really, really bad hmm. because he knew that he couldn't survive. And, um, and he said, you know, people will see me, they'll kill me. And so God put a special mark on Cain. But Cain uh, wandered away and, and, and he settled down and he built a city. Hmm. And that he named that city Enoch. And that, that's, that name means... I learned my lesson Hmm. because he realized that competition with his brother wasn't the way, the solution wasn't to eliminate his brother. That competition with lots of people in a city was the way to advance yourself. Fascinating. And not only did he learn his lesson once, he learned it twice because he had a son that he named him Enoch as well. Wow. It's fascinating stuff. We need other people and we can't... We can't lord it over people and and eliminate them like Cain did. We have to learn our lesson that it's our interaction with other people, mutually working together to make the world a better place. And, of course, that's what the life insurance that we encourage people to have is helping people do too, is to mutually bind together to make something better out of something that was scarce. Yeah, and, and giving you the opportunity, the access to your money so that you can work with other uh, human beings and exercise your creativity to create something brand new, maybe even that none of us know about yet. So we don't have to just be a brick in the wall. Absolutely we don't have not. to be a, just another ticky-tacky house on the side of a hill. You know, we can be something completely different as long as we realize that we depend on each other to make that happen. Mm-hmm. Very good. So you are listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhee's resource for today. You can go to the website life-benefits.com and you can get get access to the book How to Build Sustainable Wealth. Uh, You can also call our office to order that book at 702-660-7000. It has some tips and best practices for managing your money in the modern times that we live in so you can keep more of the money that you make and build true sustainable wealth. So you can get that book again on the website or by calling our office Have a wonderful week, and we'll be back next week on Wealth Talks.